interested in organic reactions, organic transformations, study the reaction mechanism, looking at you know, both the ground state and also transition state of a lot of different organic uh, chemistry. Uh, so as you can see from the specific uh, projects that's going on in our group, we have a, a lot of emphasis on catalysis. Right. And uh, the specific uh, area we're going to talk about today is about transition metal catalysis. Right. But let's go back to this PQI seam. I realize you know, the seam here is uh, uh, we should talk about quantum challenges. Right. So I think you know, I would probably uh, just uh, spend the next uh, 15 minutes or so to tell you a little bit about you know, what are the challenges uh, uh, to apply <coughs> quantum mechanics in studying organic reaction mechanisms. And uh, a, a little bit about you know, our solutions uh, to those challenges. So uh, again, so uh, what do we do? Uh, how, you know, what are we really interested in uh, using quantum mechanics in studying uh, organic chemistry? It's basically uh, to build uh, models who try to understand you know, how these different organic reactions occur. And you know, we work actually very closely with the experimental chemists. We have a lot of collaborations going on to uh, the, the goal is to try to get better understanding of these organic transformations and try to get uh, newer uh, reagents and catalysts uh, for uh, more efficient organic transformations. And think about the model. You know, this is a model that you know, organic uh, chemists use, right? But uh, since we are quantum mechanics, uh, we, are, uh, we can use quantum mechanics to calculate, as Dave said, you know, the transition state uh, to uh, first you look at the structure of these states and then look at you know, how the structure will affect its energy, its stability, its reactivity, and various different processes. So the approach, uh, you know, we solve this problem is again. So we start everything from quantum mechanics, and actually most of the uh, using density functional theory uh, methods. Uh, but really, we have to start by in many cases by looking at the reaction mechanisms, and then we can apply uh, what we have learned about how these reactions occur to further uh, develop models to understand reactivity and selectivity problems in organic transformations. Uh, so I highlighted a few uh, ch real challenges here. You know, of course, we have to uh, choose a method you know, that's accurate and efficient enough for the system that we are interested in. Uh, but instead, I think today I'm going to focus a, a little bit more in terms of the more applied side of you know, the challenges. Which are, uh, once we have an efficiently accurate method, uh, but there are still challenges in terms of this, you know, the exact applications, in terms of how do you really elucidate the large number of potential pathways uh, in this organic transformations. And then, you know, let's say, once we figure out how the reaction occur, how do you really build this uh, reasonable, chemically meaningful model that can, you know, experimental chemists can use and uh, uh, to build, uh, develop better chemistry. So I'm going to tell you a few examples uh, that, uh, that we are looking at uh, in this uh, organic transformations. So these specific types of transformation involve uh, the conversion of a carbon hydrogen and carbon-carbon bond and sometimes carbon-carbon double bond into functionalized uh, products. So this kind of like a strategy is a, a little bit different uh, from the traditional organic synthesis where you start from a functionalized uh, uh, starting material and then convert this functional group to another group in organic synthesis. Right? But there is clear advantages you can see by using this readily available starting materials. Uh, you, you, you take less steps and uh, uh, you generate also much less chemical waste uh, through these processes. <laughs> So in terms of uh, uh, the mechanism, if you have a transition metal catalyst to present, uh, even though you know, ha there are like hundreds of these transformations reported, you know, there are essentially like new reactions reported in the literature on a daily basis, but most of these processes involve these very common uh, uh, processes. So you, know, you, can, you can think about like a two-step strategy for, this, uh, for all of these transformations to occur. Uh, you first to start by the activation of this relatively inert carbon-hydrogen or carbon-carbon bond. Uh, into this uh, carbon metal bonded intermediates, right? So we can do that by either insert the metal uh, into the carbon hydrogen bond or carbon carbon bond, or if you have a metal hydride, you can add across the carbon carbon double bond to generate this very similar uh, carbon metal bond intermediates. And in the subsequent step, you can functionalize this reactive intermediates in, uh, into a variety of different uh, functionalized the final products. Right, so the, the mechanism seems very clear, but the question is, okay, so once we know this mechanism, how do we really uh, under, uh, uh, to understand you know, how we could, what are the factors that are actually control the outcome of these reactions? 
So uh, the first example I'm going to tell you is a, a collaboration with a Professor Gong Chen. So he uh, recently uh, moved to Nankai University from Penn State. So uh, his group is uh, interested in making this uh, benzazetidine molecule, the four-membrane uh, heterocycle shown here. Uh, so believe it or not, this is one of the uh, small organic molecules that even nowadays people don't have very good access uh, uh, to, to make these molecules. So the challenge here is apparently associated with the strong uh, ring strain. Uh, so for example, if you design these processes using the palladium catalyst the CH activation reaction, you can envision there are two possible products. Well, uh, this acyclic CO coupling product is actually more favorable by 25 kilocalories per mole. Uh, uh, again, so that's associated with the strong ring strain uh, of the benzazetidine target molecule. So experimentally, uh, our collaborator found you can essentially control the selectivity by simply using different oxidants in this reaction. So if you use this acetate-based uh, iodine-3 oxidant, uh, you get this more thermodynamically favorable product, uh, CO coupling product only. However, if you just simply switch the acetate with this DMM uh, group, now you only get this uh, CN coupling product as a major product. So this is a, dr a dramatic uh, switch of the uh, selectivity of the major products. And uh, uh, I will kind of show you how we solve this problem, how we understand uh, you know, by changing the reaction conditions, you may change the outcome of reaction. So again, this processes occur through this uh, two-step activation functionalization processes. Right? So first, uh, we break the CH bond in the starting material using a palladium callus to generate this uh, carbon-palladium bonding intermediate. Right? And the, the real trick is in the actual functionalization step. What happened afterwards is that palladium-2 intermediate react with these two different oxidants, which generate these two different palladium-3, palladium-3 palladium dimer species. And one noticeable difference is that if you have this acetate-based oxidant, that will give you this acetate group at the axial position. And then based on our uh, calculation using this density functional theory shown here, uh, we predict that the uh, CO bond forming uh, reductive combination to form the uh, acetate uh, coupled product is actually much more favorable kinetically. So these results uh, indicate if you have this acetate based uh, oxidant, you will form this uh, CO, uh, the undesired CO uh, bond coupling product. But if you start from this DMM derived palladium 3, palladium 3 dimer, what will happen is now we do not have this acetate group in the axial position, so that will uh, effectively uh, suppress the CO bond formation. So you actually form the CO bond formation uh, instead, right? So, and computationally, we do show the kinetic barrier for this uh, desired CN bond formation is now becomes favorable to give you the CN coupling product. And, uh, I want to show you this example, basically, I want to give you some idea about uh, you know, what are the possible factors that will dramatically affect the outcome of a reaction. And also, you know, this looks like you know, there are only four numbers shown here, right? But there are actually a lot of uh, chemical intuition in this, because we have to somehow understand you know, how this whole process is going on, you know, why we kind of like a propose this uh, uh, weird-looking palladium-3, palladium-3 dimer. And uh, to cut the long story short, basically a lot of these insights are actually from you know, many previous mechanistic studies from both computation and the experiments. And there are like a crystal structures for intermediates like this one or even the dimer reported before. And also, of course, there are a number of uh, uh, computational studies that uh, support this, this sort of a general mechanism in these processes. Right? But let's say uh, if you have a relatively new reaction where the mechanism is not so clear, how do we solve a problem like that? Right? So in another collaboration with uh, uh, Guang Bin Dong at the University of Texas, uh, Austin, so now we are looking at this carbon-carbon uh, bond activation uh, reaction. So in this particular transformation, the metal catalyst will cleave the, uh, this uh, highlighted carbon-carbon bond in this uh, four-member ring, and then will insert this uh, olefin uh, into this four-member ring to form a more complex bicyclic uh, product. So if you want to propose a mechanism, you can kind of like a follow this activation uh, functionalization approach to generate this uh, carbon metal bond intermediate. So that looks pretty straightforward, right? But if you really consider all the mechanistic possibilities, the, peak, the scenario is more, much more complicated. You can, uh, starting from the starting material, there are multiple pathways will give you a different type of intermediate, give you the final product, right? So again, so this is really, uh, the first time that you know, people have actually done mechanistic study on this particular transformation. And what we learned from that uh, uh, 
from our computational uh, study uh, is that you know the actual the actual reaction does not occur from the direct cleavage of the of this highlighted bond. It rather occurs from the cleavage of another carbon carbon bond, and then that's formalization, and then further functionalization. So it's actually more complex the mechanism, more complex uh, than uh, what people have thought before. So. The real picture for a catalytic reaction is something like this. So basically, starting from the reactant to a product, we have to really undergo a large number of transformations. You know, we have to investigate a large number of transition states and the intermediates. Remember, there are you know, multiple possibilities, right? So there's really a lot of work. And people are wondering, OK, so why do you guys waste so much computer time to figure out the mechanism, right? But I would say the real insight from this is, you know, instead of uh, this very complex picture, Remember, uh, everything we want to get is a very simple model for organic chemists, right? So now we can just uh, look at this two particular structure, identify, identify that, okay, so one of these is the resting state of this reaction, uh, the other is the redetermining transition state, and then we can just uh, calculate the energy difference of these two particular structures that will allow us to predict the overall barrier of this transformation. And let's say if you have this uh, Carl ligand, you want to predict the initial selectivity of the uh, structure, and that will be the initial selectivity determining transition state. So using this information, we can uh, uh, study effects of uh, 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 ligands, for example, uh, uh, that will affect the outcome of a reaction. So in this particular transformation, if you use different phosphine ligands, you actually dramatically affect the, uh, the reactivity of the catalyst, and uh, we can only predict the reactivity if we know uh, what are the rate determining step, what are the reaction mechanism, right? So based on our calculation, we did find a good agreement with the experimentally observed, observed the reactivity, but then that leads to another challenge in calculation, is how do you really interpret uh, the, compute, the computed data? Why is this particular ligand more reactive than other uh, ligands? So the typical approach that you know, uh, computational organic chemistry, organic chemists use is look at the different parameters of a ligand and then uh, uh, try to find correlations with the reactivity. Right? So this is what we did. We did find some correlation. And uh, you can also look at the computed structures of the ligand and predict you know, how, the ligand, uh, how the shapes of the ligand are different and how the different ligands interact uh, with the substrate in the different ways. Uh, then we'll, again, so give you a good correlation. But again, you know, that doesn't really tell you uh, the whole picture, right? And then if you look at all the models uh, that people uh, uh, use to, divide, to describe the effects of ligands, and you see a, a number of uh, limitations. So just to make it short, you know, what the real limitation is, again, so we're looking at the ground state property of, of the ligand, but we're trying to use that ground state property to look at the the real kinetics, the transition state property, you know, how the ligand will affect the outcome of reaction in transition state. So that's why, in our opinion, we really want to develop new models that, you know, first of all, it has to base on transition state, you know, qualitative, uh, quantitative analysis uh, using quantum mechanics, and you know, ideally, we, we will get some chemically meaningful uh, interpretation that will help the experimental organic chemists to understand uh, those chemistry. So. That being said, we are uh, applying, uh, we're actually developing a model that try to understand the ligand effects. So again, I'm moving to another type of reaction. In this case, uh, this is a uh, hydrofunctionization of this internal olefin. We recently published a paper with a bulk quote uh, using that functionalized this uh, simple olefin. But the key here is that you know, to make this reaction work, there is a dramatic effects of a ligand uh, that controls the reactivity. So, uh, and then to, to understand the effects of a ligand, uh, we devised uh, this uh, ligand substrate interaction model. But basically what we did was, first of all, we divided this activation energy into the uh, distortion of the callus and then the through space and the through bond interaction between callus and substrate. And then we can do the EDA analysis to separate the through space uh, interaction between the ligand and the substrate uh, to uh, steric and electrostatic and dispersion interactions. So to cut the long story short, basically we found the most uh, significant contribution to the overall uh, activation energy actually comes from the uh, dispersion interaction between the ligand and the substrate. And uh, the fact that the more reactive ligand or callus actually uh, promoted by the more stable uh, dispersion interaction. And we look at a large number of reactions with different ligands and different substrates, and we have a, this uh, somewhat messy plot, 
right? It's messy because in real chemistry, you know, things are messy because there are a number of factors that control the real reactivity and outcome of a reaction. But if you stare at, at this plot for a really long time, you realize, okay, so there are really a few different uh, groups of uh, substrates or reactants. And uh, so for the first group is, you know, the reactivity is actually controlled by the dispersion interaction. So there is a good linear correlation between the activation energy and the through space uh, dispersion interaction between the ligand and the catalyst, between the ligand and the substrate. And then for this particular group, you know, these are outliners because this uh, reactivity are controlled by a different term, the distortion uh, of the catalyst, uh, which you know, can translate that into chemically more meaningful terms, which means steric effects. And you can also find this particular groups of outliners. Uh, they are more reactive uh, than other uh, substrates. That's because they are polar elephants. Uh, uh, they are electronically activated because there's a more favorable uh, through bond interaction between the copper uh, and the substrate. So by doing this sort of energy decomposition analysis, we are able to tell exactly for the uh, given type of reaction what kind of effects is the major contributor uh, to the reactivity. Right. And uh, of course, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, there are two things you know, experimental chemists really care, uh, is you know, reactivity and selectivity. And we try to understand uh, using this model to study selectivity as well. But basically, to, for this particular case, if you look at the initial selectivity of the two different products, uh, the selectivity is completely controlled by steric effects based on our prediction. And in this particular case, if you look at the selectivity of these two different regio isomers, interestingly, the, uh, the energy difference uh, for these competing transition states are controlled uh, by uh, both the combination of dispersion effects and sterics. Right, I think my time is up. Uh, so with that, I really want to thank uh, you all uh, to, for this opportunity to, uh, for me to tell you a little, bit, a little bit about our research and thank all the uh, funding agencies and uh, the collaborators. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.